Good evening, everyone. I'd like to open this evening with a passage from Psalms, chapter 113. It's one of my favorite passages, Psalm 113, verses 4 through 8. Psalm 113, 4 to 8. The Bible says the Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth Himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. The Lord is not only high above all nations and his glory above the heavens, but the Lord is higher than all of the problems that you and I face this evening. And the Lord is bigger and stronger and mightier than anything that you and I may be facing today. And it says that the Lord, though he is so busy managing his universe, from his exalted throne, he humbles himself. He's interested, he cares about the littlest things in our lives. And I just praise God tonight that He is that way. And it says there, He humbles Himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. And those who are humble and willing, He raises up out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the dunghill. I'm so thankful tonight that God will meet us right where we are. Wherever we are, whatever our situation is, and He can lift us up. And I just praise God tonight for those wonderful truths that are still true 3,000 years after the psalmist David pinned them. Praise God tonight. You know, Jesus gave us a commission in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. The Bible says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You know, there's a lot of things that we get involved in, a lot of issues, a lot of discussion over all kinds of subjects, a lot of things to distract us. But the commission that Christ gave to us is very, very clear, isn't it? It's very, very clear that Christ wants us to go into all the world and teach everyone all things whatsoever he has commanded us and he has promised to be with us you know folk these words are far more powerful and far more meaningful to us tonight than they were 2000 years ago when christ gave them to his disciples because you and i are living at a time in earth's history when we are watching unfold right before our eyes the book of Revelation and specifically Revelation chapters 13 17 and 18 and we're watching it unfold right before our very eyes do you realize that you know we have been told as Seventh-day Adventist for a long long time that there would come a point in earth's history 
when freedom would be suppressed and taken away from people here in this country and then simultaneously like dominoes it would happen around the world well folk I want to tell you tonight it's happening in America we've had several warm-ups to it have our eyes been open have we responded to what is going on right in front of us and you know it's interesting it's not just something that John the Revelator foretold 2,000 years ago but it's something that Ellen White wrote in the book Great Controversy. Now I know there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists today that like to say well what Ellen White wrote that was good for the 19th century but it's not good for now. Well folk let me tell you something what Ellen White wrote is good for now because it's happening now and we better heed it now and if we don't heed it now we're not going to be ready for what's coming on this earth and I want to read some things from the Bible from the spirit of prophecy share a few comments but you know we've had some warm-ups to freedoms being gutted and taken away from us do you know that you know, 13, about 13 years ago, something happened in a place called Oklahoma City. And there was a government building called the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. And on April 19, 1995, early in the morning, the Murrah Building, a side of it, just blew up. And we were told in the controlled press that it was caused from an ammonium nitrate bomb that was in a rider or a, a truck that was parked on the street. Well, folk, Benton K. Parton, who was an explosives expert for the United States Air Force for three decades, I want to read to you what he said. Benton K. Parton, this is what he said about that. He said, it is impossible that the destruction to the building could have resulted from such a bomb alone. To cause the damage pattern that occurred to the Murrah building, there would have had to have been demolition charges at several supporting column bases at locations not accessible from the street to supplement the truck bomb damage. Indeed, a careful examination of photographs showing the collapsed column bases reveals a failure mode produced by demolition charges and not by a blast from the truck bomb. Blast through air is a very inefficient energy coupling mechanism against heavily reinforced concrete beams and columns. So Benton K. Parton, an explosives expert in the United States Air Force for three decades, he said that. He said the ammonium nitrate bomb couldn't have done that damage to the Murrah building. He said there had to have been demolitions inside the building at specific places to cause that damage. Well, what happened in the aftermath of Oklahoma City? What happened with Bill Clinton? What was passed through Congress in the aftermath of that terror attack. This is taken from the Orlando Sentinel, April 21, 1995. It says the Omnibus Counterterrorism Act of 1995 was on a slow track in Congress and the subject of a lively debate as to whether it would violate some fundamental civil liberties, including the right to confront one's accuser. Now, after the Oklahoma City bombing, there are few sure legislative bets in Washington. Democrats and Republicans issue news releases Thursday calling for the bill's quick passage. What's the point? Bill Clinton had 
terrorism legislation. It looked like it was going to go like a turtle through Congress because it was an attack on certain fundamental civil liberties. But after the Oklahoma City bombing, what happened? Democrats and Republicans, all of a sudden they joined together and said, we're going to pass it. Doesn't matter what laws, doesn't matter what liberties are taken away. Does that alarm you as a Seventh-day Adventist? Does that alarm you as an American? Don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Don't even have to be a Christian. Does that alarm you as an American that the liberties in the Constitution that have made us the nation that we are, that have made us a Protestant country, that they are under attack? Does that concern you? Does that register in our minds? We have work to do. We have a mission to accomplish. God has called us, not heathens, not Baptists, not Pentecostals, not uni Universalists. Nobody else in the world has God called, but He's called us as Seventh-day Adventists to give the world a distinctive message of warning to this final generation. Were we awakened after Oklahoma City? God was trying to awaken us as Seventh-day Adventists. It's time to go home. It's time to finish the work. It's time to receive the latter rain and to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. Did we hear the warning? What did we do in response to that? Did we get out and start spreading literature out to people? Did we start warning our neighbors? Did we start preaching and studying prophecy? Or did we just keep on celebrating? Did we keep just getting the music turned up louder and louder so that we wouldn't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Get ready, get ready, get ready! So 1995 passes. Liberties are gutted in the United States of America. Nobody says a word, for the most part. And so God sends another warning. Sends another warning. Because he wants to say, my people, I'm about to come. Are you ready? Are you preparing other people? Are you interested in doing evangelism? Six years later, another terror attack takes place. What was it called? 9-11. 9-11. You say, Bill, I've heard about that so many times. I don't want to hear about that anymore. Well, let me, let me come at it from a different angle. Do you know how many times we've had terror attacks in this country that have led us into war? Do you know how many times that's happened? You say, well, yeah, after 9-11 we did it. No. Folk, this has been repeated three times in U.S. history, and probably more. I just go back to World War I. Do you know why the United States got into World War I? Do you realize that we never wanted to fight European wars? Do you know why the Monroe Doctrine was written? Have you ever heard of that? You say, that was some stale document that a president wrote or gave a State of the Union address back in the 1820s and I slept through as the teacher talked about it. No, it was a little bit more serious than that. Because you see, folk, in 1814 and then again in 1822, there were two congresses that took place in Europe. One was called the Congress of Vienna. Another one was called the Congress of Verona. And in both of those congresses, the European powers under Clement von Metternich of Austria and the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church 
and Pope Pius VII, they all came together and joined in an, a holy alliance. It was the most unholy thing that w was ever formed. But they called it holy because the Pope put his stamp of approval on it. Well, you know what they planned at those congresses? They planned to figure out through foreign immigration how they would destroy the United States of America. Isn't that interesting? How at this point in Earth's history, immigration, foreign immigration is such a big issue. I wonder if there is some element that's behind the foreign immigration problem today that was behind it in the 1800s. Is that possible? Well, a man by the name of Samuel Morse, have you ever heard of him? You know, the tick, 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 the Morse code man? He didn't just invent the Morse code. He wrote two books. One was published in 1835. Another was published in 1844. And both of those books, the first one was called Imminent Dan Dangers to the Free Institutions of the United States Through Foreign Immigration. And he cried out to America. He said, folk, the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order are seeking through foreign immigration to destroy the liberties of America. America didn't hear him. So in 1844, he wrote another book called Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. Well, James Monroe... James Monroe in 1823, right around the end of 1823, gave his famous Monroe Doctrine. And in the Monroe Doctrine, he said to the powers of Europe and to Pope Pius and to Metternich and the Holy Alliance, he said, you stay across the Atlantic over there and we'll stay over here. Don't you dare try to colonize in the Western Hemisphere. Because if you do, we will consider that an act of war. So America stayed out of Europe and Europe stayed out of America. At least in theory. They didn't do that through the money system, however because they continued to try to set up a central bank in the United States because they knew just like Lenin who said 90 percent of communizing a nation is through a central bank so Europe the Rothschild family the Jesuit order used the banking system to take America by the throat. And they've got America by the throat today. You think all these things that are going, happening on Wall Street and the, the housing collapse and the falling economy is just a happenstance? It just happened out of the blue? No, folk, it's been planned. It's been planned because the financial markets of the world are controlled. We'll get to that later if we can tonight, if not tomorrow. But Revelation 18 is very, very clear that the merchants of the earth are made rich by Babylon the Great. And as long as they do what Babylon the Great says, they're fine. We'll look at that maybe this evening or tomorrow. But anyway, Monroe said, you stay over there, we'll stay over here. America did not want to fight any battles in Europe. And so World War I starts in 1914. And America stays out of the war. And Woodrow Wilson in 1916, he comes up for re-election and he says, I'm not going to get our boys involved in war. No way, we're not going to have anything to do with that war. Well, while he was promising the American people that, his second self, a man by the name of Edward Mandel House, was over in Europe planning on how America could get into the war. And so what happens? 
right around the re-election time, a ship is blown up. It's called the Lusitania. 195 Americans are on board. And in response to the bombing of the Lusitania, the Germans were blamed. And guess where Americans went? They went into World War I. It took a terror attack to bring America into World War I, folks. It took a terror attack to bring America into World War II. What do we call that terror attack? It was called Pearl Harbor. That's right. It was a terror attack that Hamilton Fish, who wrote a book called FDR, The Other Side of the Coin, he said, he was a congressman, Hamilton Fish, wrote the book, FDR, The Other Side of the Coin. He said, FDR knew at least a year in advance that Japan would attack America somewhere in the Pacific and that would bring America into World War II. Hamilton Fish also said that FDR actually goaded the Japanese by an economic blockade that brought, that forced Japan to bomb Pearl Harbor. Woodrow Wilson knew what was happening that would bring America into World War I. It took a terror attack. FDR was planning on getting America into the Second World War through a terror attack. Did we want to go to Afghanistan with the Taliban and Osama bin Laden and then Saddam Hussein? We didn't want to go there. Americans didn't. So what did it take, folks? It took a terror attack. Bingo! It happened with the Lusitania, it happened with Pearl Harbor, and now it happens with 9-11. And presto, America goes into war. Three wars, by the way, that Albert Pike, a leading illuminist, which makes him a Jesuit, the top Jesuit illuminist in the United States in the 1860s, Albert Pike said that they were planning those three wars. Wake up, folks. It's late. It's late. What happened after 9-11? You say, oh, well, we went to war. You know what George Bush called the war on terror? He made a mistake and had to retract it. It was in USA Today. He said that America was fighting a crusade. A crusade. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Do you know why crusades were fought in the Dark Ages, folk? Because the papacy wanted to retake Jerusalem from Islam. So why is the war on terror being attacked? You say, oh, well, it's because of that madman Saddam Hussein. Think again. Oh, it's because of Osama. Think again, folks. George Bush did not make a mistake. It is a crusade because George Bush is not working for America. He's working for his master, in Rome. He's fighting a crusade to drive, to make it so bad in the Middle East so that the world will cry out for a peacemaker to come to Jerusalem. And who will that world peacemaker be? The Pope himself. You say, Bill, I think you're a conspiracy theorist. Now, I don't want to get too far off my subject tonight, but you say, George Bush is working for Rome? You're in the same time zone. You're not sounding right. What's wrong? Well, folks, let me read something to you. You tell me who George Bush is. I'll let George Bush tell you who he's working for. How's that? How's that? 
Did you know that in March of 2001 that a cultural center was dedicated to the greatest enemy of this republic? Do you know who the greatest enemy of this republic is? It's not Saddam Hussein. It's not the leader of Iran. It's not the leader of North Korea. It's not Putin of Russia. Who's the greatest enemy of this republic? His name is Benedict XVI, folks. That is the greatest enemy of this republic. You know, folk, how is it that as Americans we've lost sight of our heritage? We are a Protestant nation. Do we realize that? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. Anyway, a cultural center was dedicated to John Paul II in March of 2001. Reuters news service said this, March 24, 2001. This was George Bush's dedicatory speech. The best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teaching seriously, to listen to his words and put his words and his teachings into action here in America. Let me ask you a question. If we put his teachings into action in America, what has to go? the greatest document ever made in the annals of human history has got to be shredded. It's called the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's what the president said. Here's another statement. This is taken from the Washington Times, April 16, 2001. It says, in 1960, John Kennedy went from Washington to Texas to assure Protestant preachers that he would not obey the Pope. Now, why did John Kennedy have to go from Washington to Texas to assure Protestant preachers that he wouldn't obey the Pope? Why did he have to do that? Because he was a Catholic. And you know what? John Kennedy a Roman Catholic was the only US president in the 20th century who has ever bucked the Vatican. Do you realize that? The Washington Times continues, in 2001 George Bush came from Texas up to Washington to assure a group of Catholic bishops that he would obey the Pope. So who is pulling George Bush's strings? The Pope of Rome. Revelation 17. Notice this. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. You know, I got a paper from a gentleman over in Australia recently. He sent it to me and he said, um, he said, would you please comment on this article? He said, I found it most shocking. Well, a gentleman got on there, and I've read this from a man by the name of Samuel Bakioki as well, who believes the same idea that I'm about to express to you. They both believe that our, our concept that the papacy is the Antichrist, that we need to readjust that some. Because here at the end of verse history, it obviously is more Islam than Rome. Now isn't that an interesting twist, folks? You know what, that was, that was really nice the way I said that. That's not an interesting twist. That is a blasphemous deception. That's what that is. Islam is a smokescreen, folks, today. You say, but, but Peter Jennings before, but Katie Couric and, and Charles Gibson in USA Today, they don't. Do you think for one minute 
Rome, as, as they're putting millions of dollars in those people's pockets, you think they're going to tell you the truth? Let's think again, folks. Let's think again. Let's notice what the Bible says. Revelation 17. Verse 1, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, we could go into a lot here, but who is the great whore of Revelation 17? Who is Babylon the great? The papacy. The papal system. Notice verse 2 with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the kings of the earth have committed fornication with the papacy. Who are the kings of the earth? The rulers of the earth. What's George Bush? He's a ruler, isn't he? According to Revelation 17 and verse 2, Who's George Bush working for? He's working for Babylon the Great, the papacy, folks. That's who he's working for. Well, by the way, who, who, did, who did Saddam Hussein work for? He worked for the papacy also. You say, but wait a minute, that's not the way I read that. America's against Iraq, and Saddam Hussein and George Bush were more... No, they're not. No, they're not. They're both working for Rome, doing exactly what they're told to do. Because the papacy controls the play. And Bush is on their strings, and Saddam Hussein is on, was on their strings, and the leader of Iran is on their strings. And however they pull the strings, so will they move. And what is the ultimate goal? There's two goals. Just as it was in the Civil War with the North and the South, the papacy controlled both sides. They controlled Jeff Davis in the South. They controlled the radical Red Republicans in the North. Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, and the like in Congress. They controlled both sides create a bloody mess, and you rule over the ruins. The papacy has done that for centuries, folk. They did it in Vietnam. They did it in Korea. They did it, they've done it all over the world. They did it in Germany. So what do they want from the Middle East? Create a bloodbath, so we'll bring a peacemaker to Jerusalem. And what do they want from America as America crumbles? They want this constitution torn to shreds. Torn to shreds. You know, Revelation 17 and verse 2 says, The kings of the earth are committing fornication with the papacy. Verse 18 is even stronger Revelation 17, verse 18, it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So the papacy doesn't just commit fornication with the kings of the earth. They rule the kings of the earth. You know, one Catholic priest, priest Phelan in Western Watchmen, June 27, 1912, he said, the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. And what does an altar boy do? An altar boy says, Priest, whatever you say, I will do. And that's what George Bush and the leaders of this world are doing today. Exactly as they are being told. In the aftermath of 9-11, as I sat in my family room that evening, 
All day I'm milling over in my mind what's transpiring as I see the, the planes going into the towers. And I'm thinking, I wonder when it's going to be said right on the television and then in the newspapers and magazines that the only way America can be safe from terror is if we give up our liberties. I wonder when I'm going to hear that. Well, it didn't take very long because Peter Jennings that night of September 11th was interviewing George Stephanopoulos. And Peter Jennings said, George, how can America be safe from another terror attack? George Stephanopoulos acted as though he'd been rehearsing the following statement for weeks. He said, Peter, the only way America can be safe is if they give up their liberties. And then the next day, Tuesday, September 12, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Sabbath, and Sunday, and Monday, and all through, you go back and research the Atlanta Constitution, Newsweek, Time, any major magazine or newspaper, right around, right after September 11, and that's all that was said. America's got to give up their liberty. America's got to give up their freedom. Well, folk... Who wants to destroy our freedom? Is that not what we were told in Revelation 13, two, two millennia ago? Is that not what great controversy said would happen? That there would be an attack on the liberties of this country? So that then there would be Sunday laws in this land? And so what would we do? Prophecy unfolding right before our eyes. What is our response? What are we doing in response to prophecy happening right in our lap? Just going on, living as I always did. That's, that's, that's not the right response, folk. That's not the response that heaven wants and demands of us at this time of earth's history. God has given us a gold mine to sit on, to hide under a bushel, to hide under a bed. No, to set it on a hill and say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I've got a message for you. Because we've got a message that's better than anything. It's the only message of hope, folks, that this world has or could have. You and I possess it. You and I possess it. You say, oh, but Bill, if we start going around and telling people these things, somebody could get upset. You know what? The majesty of heaven saw us without hope. And the majesty of heaven knew exactly what he would face if he came to this world. He knew they'd, they'd rip him to shreds. He knew they'd pull the hair right out of his cheeks they knew that he would be humiliated. He knew he would be hunted and stalked every minute of his life. He knew that as a babe that the king would even come after and try to kill him. That there was a price on his head every day of his life. Did it stop him? If the majesty of heaven had taken the position that we like to take, we wouldn't have a prayer tonight, folks. 
we wouldn't have a prayer. We wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. I'd be out probably in some bar somewhere, filling that God void in my life that only Christ can satisfy. But Jesus came at infinite expense to himself that we might have hope. And he calls on us tonight to reach out, to help other people. You know, after 9-11, that was strike two. Oklahoma City was a gutting of liberty. 9-11 was another gutting of liberty. How many, more, how many more terror attacks, how many more catastrophes will it take in this country for there to be Sunday laws? When, when, when will we finally say, you know, I think it's time we wake up. You know, I really think that I have a message that I better be sharing with the world. When, what will it take, folks? What will it take? You know, I'm going to tell you something. After 9-11... I watched for a few months. I thought, I know there's going to be some Seventh-day Adventists that are going to start putting it in magazines and in periodicals and books about what's going on in America and how our liberties are being destroyed and we're on the brink of Sunday laws and somebody's going to warn the world as to what Rome is doing. And I didn't see anything. And I went into an ABC there in Winter Park. There was nothing. And I expected it in periodicals, and I didn't see anything. And it was just status quo. We just go on. Well, you know what, folks? Status quo is not good enough. And so I, I was giving a series of meetings out in Southern California, and a gentleman came up to me after the meetings. He said, he said you've got to put that into a book. Because he said, I've got to warn the leaders of China as to what's going on in their country. Because, folk, what's happening in America is happening around the world. I get people who write to me about the secret terrorists and the enemy unmasked in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in the Philippines, in Korea, in South America, in Europe, and they say, it's amazing what you write about in your books is happening in our country too. Folk, you know what? There were a lot of words that I used to use before I became a Christian that I'm very ashamed of when I had a gutter mouth. But after writing these books and mass mailing these books, I've remembered those words all over again because those are some of the words that people write and that's how they describe me. And I can't use those words right here tonight. And I've had people tell me, they've, they've called me, uh, we started mass mailing these books to uh, different towns in Florida and across the United States. And I could tell you story after story after story. We started getting all kinds of garbage mail. And one of them was addressed to Lance in Boyle. Figure that out. Lance and Boyle. What does that mean, folks? That means keep putting these books out and we'll boil you. Lance and Boyle. I got the message. I've had folk write to me. I've had people threaten me and my family. But folk, you know what? The work goes on. Because we have a work to do that nobody else in the world can do. Nobody else. The state of Florida sent me a letter recently. They said, we're getting complaints up here in Tallahassee. 
We'd like to know what you're doing. I have nothing to hide. I wrote back and I said, friends, we mass mail books that I have written. We offer people Bible studies because we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And if they write back in, if they sign the card and send it back in, we get them into a Bible study program because we want them to be ready for events coming on this earth and for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I haven't heard back from Tallahassee folk, but it doesn't matter. We have work to do. We have work to do. We've mass mailed towns, and I've gone into those areas and spoken out in Oregon. Catholic priests will get into the newspaper, and apostate Protestants, uh, uh, priests and pastors will get into the newspaper, and Seventh-day Adventist conference pastors will get into the newspaper, and they'll denounce this book. They'll denounce it. You'll say, oh no, a Seventh-day Adventist would denounce that book? Well, you know what they say. They say, our, our work as Seventh-day Adventists is to promote a healthy lifestyle. Well, do I agree with that? Of course I do. Every single member of my family has suffered from some bad disease, whether it be high blood pressure, hypoglycemia, diabetes, cancer, high cholesterol. All of my family except one person, me. And guess what? I'm the only Seventh-day Adventist. I praise God for the health message. The, the Seventh-day Adventist pastor, he went on, he said, we, we want to teach people how to be healthy. We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Of course I do. He said, and we believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Do I believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Of course I do. If that wasn't the greatest message in the world, I wouldn't be here tonight. So I believe in all those things. But the Seventh-day Adventist pastor stopped short to say, we've been given a message to warn the world about the papacy and the fallen apostate Protestant denominations. He didn't put that in his article. Isn't that interesting? Must have just been an oversight. Yeah. Folk, God's given us two wake-up calls. Two wake-up calls. Had a gentleman call me recently from uh, West Virginia. He said, son, he said, I'm a retired Seventh-day Adventist minister. I said, it's nice to meet you, sir. He said, uh, he said, I've read your books, The Enemy Unmasked and The Secret Terrorist. He said, son, those books, those books contain the message that Seventh-day Adventists should have been shouting from the housetops for decades. I said, I agree with that, sir. He said, I want to tell you, I'm a part of the Christian coalition in my state. In fact, he said, I'm the head of it. And he said, now I want you to understand, I'm not the head of it because I support it, because it's the greatest ecumenical church movement in this country today. He said, I'm in it because I want to know what's going on. I said, okay. He said, last spring... He said, I was invited as a part of the Christian Coalition to a meeting in Washington, D.C. I met with many Catholic cardinals and the Speaker of the House, a woman named Nancy Pelosi, who, by the way, since we're passing by Nancy Pelosi, do you know that when Nancy Pelosi was made the Speaker of the House, that she invited a dear friend of hers, a man by the name of priest Stephen Privet, who is the president of the University of San Francisco. He was the first Jesuit priest to ever address a full house of Congress. Folk, where are we? We're at the end. 
we're at the end of earth's history and we're watching prophecy unfold. Mercy. This pastor from West Virginia, he said this cardinal stood up at the meeting and he said, friends, he said the only hope for the United States of America is if we pass a national day of rest. He told me, he said, son, in about three months, he said, there's a man visiting the United States of America. We're going to be meeting with him April the 17th. His name is Pope Benedict the 16th, who from the very beginning of his pontificate has been espousing Sunday worship throughout the world. Do you realize that the document Dies Domini, the sacredness of Sunday that was written in 2000, that was given as an encyclical by Pope John Paul II. It was not written by John Paul II. It was written by the man who was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is a fancy name for the Holy Office of the Inquisition. And the man who wrote it was the man who was the head of that office. The man's name was Joseph Ratzinger. Joseph Ratzinger today is known as Pope Benedict XVI. He wrote Dies Domini. He wrote it, folks. He's not coming to America in April to have tea with the Cardinals of New York. I'd like to close with a little story this evening from 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. There was a horrible famine in Samaria. A horrible famine. It was so bad that mothers were eating their children. I can't even fathom that. Mothers were eating their children. It was terrible. Ben-Hadad had Samaria surrounded. Elisha was there. It was getting so bad, the people, they were gnawing on leather. Verse 3 of 2 Kings chapter 7, it says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. So the lepers said, we're sitting here in the gate. Given a, a little bit more time, we're going to die. So why don't we go out, throw ourselves on the mercy of this ravaging Syrian army. The worst they can do is kill us. But maybe they'll give us something to eat. Verse 5 says, They rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. 
And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and they did eat and drink and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Those lepers were feasting. They were becoming wealthy men, clothing, gold, silver, riches, food. They didn't know what to do with themselves. Verse 9, then said they one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. Those lepers finally came to their senses and said, this isn't right. We've got a gold mine. We're feasting. And we've got the best news in all the world that there is a feast in the camp of the Syrians. While the people back in Samaria are starving to death. And they said, we better go tell them. And if we don't, some mischief is going to come upon us. So they went back into Samaria and they said, Folk, there's a feast out there. There's a feast, folks, today. And we're the only people in the world that have that feast. We're the only people. You know, right now, as a result of our mass mailings that we've done in various parts of the country, we've got over about 1,200 people, 1,200 people right now taking Bible studies. Folk, those are heirs to the kingdom of God. They didn't have a clue what was going on. These aren't Seventh-day Adventists waking up. These are what we would class as heathen. Magi from the east who don't know what they're doing and why they're coming to Jerusalem. But they're taking Bible studies. They want to know what's going on. They want to know the truth of Scripture. And who's going to tell them? Charles Stanley? Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Myers? Are they going to tell them the truth? No. We're the only ones that have the feast. What are we going to do with it? <laughs>